All right, everyone, welcome one and all to this very special edition of the Dissident Film Club. Keaton Weiss here with Russell Dobular. Hello. So we have a very special program uh, in the offing for this evening. Russell, do you want to introduce the film and a little bit about our filmmaker, what we're going to be doing tonight? All right, so we are going to be doing the second cooler. Um, which is a lighthearted romp through the Sonoran Desert. Okay. <laughs> I'm kidding. It's not lighthearted at all. Um, this is a very unique documentary by our very own Ellen Jimerson um, about aspects of the migrant crisis that are not normally really explored. It, it really explores how NAFTA kind of screwed everybody. I, I think we tend to have the perspective that NAFTA destroyed American communities economically. And we assume, even, even though we, we may not, uh, you know, as leftists have a, have a hatred towards people who benefited from it, I think most of us do assume, well, in Mexico, they benefited from it. And this film really debunks that and shows you how NAFTA really just pitted workers on both sides of the border against each other while the corporations that wrote NAFTA clean up. Yeah, that is it in a nutshell. It's a really, really great film. Um, I'm so glad that we're going to get to screen this. It's very informative. It's very intimate. It's also very suspenseful. It's very emotionally intense, especially towards the end um so you guys are in for a real treat this evening this is a great um opportunity to get to screen this we want to thank our patrons for making nights like this possible the more support we get the more streams we get to do and so our patrons like i said they're the backbone of the show you can go to patreon.com front slash do dissidents we are going to do a filmmaker q a afterwards um, so there will be a talk back. If you guys have any questions that come up while you're watching the movie or immediately after the movie, please put those in the chat. The way to guarantee those chats are seen, obviously, is to make them colorful chats, i.e. super chats. Uh, that's how you, we, you can guarantee they'll be read and guarantee that we will not miss them. And uh, obviously, in all seriousness, um, the more donations and the more signups we have at Patreon and Substack, uh, the more streams we could do, the more opportunities we have for evenings like this. And so thank you guys very much. Thank you to our Patreon supporters. We want to thank our newest patron, Cricket. Cricket, who we've seen in the chat from time to time. Uh, you signed up, I believe it was yesterday or the day before. So thank you very much for that. Your name is on the scroll right there. And so um, the way this works, like I said, once again... We are going to have a talk back after the show. We have the Reverend Dr. Ellen Jimerson. I'm going to bring her on here to say a quick hello before just a little wave. She is uh, waiting backstage. She is going to be doing a Q&A talk back with us and hopefully many of you guys uh, immediately following the film. The film runs about an hour and 20 minutes. Actually, it runs exactly that long. And so we will see you then. We're going to take our logo off the screen. We're going to turn the lights down here. And uh, once again, thank you very much for being here this evening, and please enjoy the second cooler. There are approximately 12 million migrants in the United States illegally. Why do they come? Are they caught up in a system that is fully apparent neither to them nor to us? Are U.S. citizens innocent bystanders? Are U.S. citizens caught up in the same system? Who benefits? <laughs>
Muy bonita. Um, y nos la pasábamos siempre juntos. Toda la familia convivíamos. Pues ahora es diferente. Ahora este. Why have millions of Latin Americans left their homes and families to make an illegal, expensive, dangerous, and sometimes deadly journey north? Americans are not innocent bystanders to the outpouring of illegal Latin American migrants. The cumulative effect of nearly two centuries of U.S. economic and foreign policies have contributed to the massive poverty and limited access to power of the people of Latin America. For a number of reasons, Central America was not incorporated into the United States formally in the 1850s, say. And there's a fascinating history there because a lot of the, um, uh, the issue of whether they would come in as slave-owning or non-slave-owning states. and so. It was just clearly it wasn't going to happen. What's emerged instead is this uh, much more complicated system through which this very, very powerful country to the north finds various ways to dominate these small Central American countries. If you look carefully at the cases, um, there's some, you know, some pretty uh, clear, clear cases of, of U.S. domination and of, of just. Uh, comprehensive violation of the sovereignty of these countries. It's very important to keep in mind that today the U.S. Southwest was effectively stolen. And, I mean, first and foremost, it was stolen from the indigenous population. But it was also land that was effectively stolen from Mexico through the U.S.-Mexico War of 1846 to 1848, through which the United States effectively coerced Mexico into ceding what was then about 40 percent of Mexican territory. What the United States so stole wasn't only the land, but all the rights that went with it. This did not happen uh, in a random, unintended way. There is a history of um, unequal relations between the United States and Latin America, and especially Mexico and Central America. On the one hand, there's a history of um, unequal economic relations that have have um, put these Latin American countries in an economic rut uh, that has led them to kind of an, an unequal and highly exploitative system uh, that leaves them forever dependent and subordinate to the more prosperous industrialized worlds. On the other hand, there are intentional policies by the United States, policies of intervention, policies of uh, human rights violations that the U.S. has either directly participated in or supported that has furthered this relationship of, of dominance and subordination. Is the United States' increasingly rigid demarcation line fundamentally about promoting national security and the rule of law? Or is it fundamentally about cosmopolitan class privilege, no-holds-barred capitalism, and global apartheid? Si estuviera en mis manos, 
poder hacer cruzar a mi presidente por el desierto y sufrir uno de todos los atropellos que sufren los mexicanos cuando cruzan por ahí. Creo que sería una buena idea. In a few moments, I will sign the North American Free Trade Act into law. NAFTA will tear down trade barriers between our three nations. It will create the world's largest trade zone and create 200,000 jobs in this country. In 1992, Canada, the United States, and Mexico entered into the North American Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA. Signed by Canada's Prime Minister Brian Mulroney, America's President Bill Clinton, and Mexico's President Carlos Salinas, the purpose of the agreement was to facilitate the free flow of goods and capital across North American borders and open up markets to corporate producers. NAFTA was intended to create corporate wealth. In that, it has been successful. Changes to the system, or reforms as NAFTA's proponents called them, were made in three broad sectors, autos, energy, and agriculture. According to people who analyze NAFTA from the perspective of small, traditional Mexican farmers, NAFTA has caused catastrophic suffering. Uh, the problems that NAFTA has built on uh, in Mexico and in Central America is one of extreme inequality. The levels of extreme inequality in, in Mexico and Central America have grown since, um, since the passage of NAFTA. And that extreme inequality is fundamental to the process of migration that we're looking at. If you ask an economic migrant, would, if you had those opportunities in Mexico, would you come to the United States? The majority of them will say, absolutely not. No hay, no hay para... Para ganar un poco de dinero, pues no, no, no hay nada, nada más se siembra maíz y frijol, nada más eso se siembra pues para comer, para un poco para, o sea, pues si me gano un poco maíz, pero se vende como 10, 10, 10, 15 kilos, pero para comprar un... NAFTA lifted tariffs U.S. corporate producers have to pay to export corn, beans, and other crops to Mexico. This allowed them to undersell traditional farmers. In addition to NAFTA's lifting of tariffs, President Salinas repealed Article 27 of the Mexican Constitution, which had provided Mexican farmers with subsidies. One of the problems that have had the small producers in Mexico has been the privatization of the land, which has been related to NAFTA, with the Free Trade Agreement. When the free trade agreement was signed in 1997, the Mexican government was able to do that with the Free Trade Agreement. Muchos de los agricultores, muchos de los ejidatarios eh, perdieron sus derechos comunitarios. Figures vary, but many analysts conclude that NAFTA has pushed at least one and a half million peasants, many of whom were in the corn and bean sectors of the Mexican agricultural economy, over the edge financially. NAFTA forced these peasants off their lands and into migration. Están exigiendo una tierra, unos ejidatarios, y no, no, se, no les daban. Uno se, de, tan, de tan impotente se quemó, se quemó y después murió. Porque la, la, la protesta es seria, la protesta, que nadie le hace caso. Entonces han llegado hasta el extremo de prenderse el fuego para ver si las en casa. The figure of peasants that have been displaced and indigenous peoples displaced because of the passing of NAFTA uh, is a scandalously high number. Bueno, es difícil saber cuánta gente ha sido desplazada del sector eh, del sector rural debido a las diferentes presiones, el Tratado de Libre Comercio, Artículo 27, etc. Pero se puede se podría hablar de por lo menos un millón, dos millones de personas. The government understood at the time they signed it that they were signing away uh, life, life rights for a large part of its, its rural population. 
It wasn't a surprise uh, for the government leaders and it wasn't a surprise for the peasantry. What happened is that small farmers just got swept away. The people who are hungriest, the poorest, uh, have least access to, to jobs, who uh, no longer can sell the, the small subsistence crops that they've been raising, are those that are forced to migrate. They have no other alternative. The result is the same on both sides of the border, and that is that the elites uh, uh, benefit enormously. Uh, the, the folks who already have the educational opportunities and already have the wealth and already have the power, uh, their wealth and power is enhanced dramatically and, and uh, the poor are the ones who are excluded. <laughs> And, uh, and the middle class is squeezed. We can't have our cake and eat it too. We can't have a global political economy that helps drive people from their homelands right? and then deny them the right to come to places where they're able to achieve the livelihoods that have been denied to them in large part because of our actions. Right? The only way we can do that is by being morally corrupt. And that's what the system of global apartheid is. It's morally corrupt. Uh, they had hired me as a consultant for insulation down there. Uh, they hired me at $46 an hour plus all my expenses. And the, and the people that I were training down there made $5 a day. A los 14 años comencé a trabajar en, en, en maquiladora. Uh, tuve que salirme de la escuela porque la economía empezó a bajar en, en México. Mi mamá empezó a, poner, a tener problemas de salud. Entonces todos mis hermanos decidimos salir a trabajar para ayudar a mi papá y a mi mamá. The conditions in the Maquila areas was frightful. People living in cardboard houses. Literally, there were cardboard, the lucky ones would have tin, a tin roof on cinder blocks. No electricity, no running water. There, there would be uh, a sewer uh, trench down the middle of the little streets. And I, I suppose they'd have a pump somewhere to pump their water and I suspected it was probably contaminated water. Cuando me junté con mi esposo en la maquiladora, pues al a casi al año salí embarazada de mi primer hija, que yo tenía que estar yendo frecuentemente al baño. En la maquiladora no se me daba permiso para ir al baño. Yo tenía se me daba permiso solamente dos veces. I spoke with a gentleman that had lost an eye. I spoke with another woman that had lost several fingers. No compensation, no nothing. And what do they do? They fire them. When you're purely doing everything based on profit, it doesn't matter where you live, it doesn't matter where your headquarters is, the desire to move overseas is almost too much for some people to handle. So I, I do have a, diff a difficult time with that. And the government gave them incentives to, to move down there. I, you know, I thought the American government was supposed to protect the American people and good paying jobs for Americans. Well, how is that right when you take and you tell a corporation, I'm gonna give you a tax incentive to close your truck factory here in the United States, take jobs from American people because they don't want them anyways and we're gonna send them all to Mexico. To me, that doesn't make any sense. Well, I think that's the number one problem with the working people of America is the outsourcing of jobs. And uh, a lot of that is, goes back to NAFTA, CAFTA, and the China Trade Agreement. Well, you know, that was a big North American Free Trade Agreement which uh, was supposed to bring the Mexicans up to our standard of living. Instead of that, all the companies went offshore and used cheap slave labor to m make the product and ship it back into the United States. And it caused a lot of our plants here to have to shut down because of that. Democratic and Republican grassroots politicians and many labor union representatives also say that they are concerned that migrants and the employers who hire them are causing a rush to the bottom in terms of wages and working conditions. 
it's my role as an elected official here to look out for the people that I represent and for the people of the state of Alabama. Uh, wages have been suppressed. People have been displaced from their jobs because of illegal immigration. Our people could use those jobs, but they're not there for them. Just like in Laurel, Mississippi, 600 plus folks sized, stand in line for those jobs. So Americans will work. They're not fat and lazy. Migrants, pro-migrant activists, and employers say migrants only take jobs domestic workers don't want. Yeah, one of the things you hear is that immigrants aren't taking Americans' jobs because the Americans don't want the jobs that they're doing. Uh, that, that's not true. The Americans will do anything. They're taking jobs that Americans won't do at those wage rates or those benefits. When we go and negotiate contracts, then it makes it hard for us to get a decent wage in there because they know, the companies know that they can get the Hispanics to come in and work for the wages by minimum wage. And the benefits and stuff that we try and get for our employees, then that makes it hard for us to get a decent package once we go in negotiation. And the one that's, getting, that's making the money off of this and taking advantage of everybody is actually the people that's hiring them. They're still charging the same prices as if they had Americans out there working. They're uh, paying the immigrants less. If I was addressing immigrants in general, uh, we would try to organize them. If we could or organize the immigrants, then we can compete with them. It goes back to then we're making the same wages, then we're getting the same benefits, and probably illegal immigrants too. <laughs> You took my joy, you don't have very much yourself. I know why you took my home to leverage a bit more wealth. I know why you took my medicine and give it to the insurance man. But why did you take my job when I was doing the best that I can? Free trade did to Mexico's small farmers on a massive scale what it did to Alabama's textile industry on a small scale. To the people of DeKalb County's town of Fort Payne, which once prided itself on being the sock capital of the world, free trade agreements with China, Canada, Caribbean countries, and Central America have been devastating. By 2005, 50 of Fort Payne's 150 sock manufacturing companies had closed or experienced employee layoffs. We've been in business for 25 years when we'd had to close in 05. And you'd have all these families working for you and they became your family. It was like Thanksgiving and Christmas, you know, the mills would shut down and we'd have Thanksgiving parties and Christmas parties. And you knew who you were working with and uh, you got real close with those people. They've gone in other directions now to find work and uh, in the Chattanooga area and Scottsboro and different places, Huntsville. In 2007, Montreal-based Gildan Activewear bought V.I. Pruitt & Son, Fort Payne's largest sock factory. Gildan, which had manufacturing facilities in Honduras, the Dominican Republic, Nicaragua and Haiti, was an opponent of import safeguards. Do you have any feel for why a Montreal-owned company would want to come to Alabama and buy up the textile industry? I can tell you why. Uh, because labor in the South is cheap and there's no fear of unions. <laughs> Gildan is a multinational company that exists for one reason and one reason only, and that's profit. Um, basically, they're utilizing cheap labor with no benefits, uh, they don't have to invest in machinery. They, have, they don't have to invest in um, land, buildings, any assets on U.S. soil. They move from country to country to country wherever the labor and the cost of doing business is the cheapest.
In 2008, 26 anti-illegal migrant bills were introduced into the Alabama State Legislature. Alabama State Senator Scott Beeson sponsored many of the bills. For illegal immigration, jobs and costs are big issues. They're easier to talk about. Um, one of the issues for me is, is also kind of a, I see a gradual loss of what I consider a unified society. I see the gradual degradation of the English language. Um, there are people who will say assimilation is going to happen. It's always happened before, ass before, assimilation will happen again. When the great migrations from Europe, where you had Italians coming in and people from countries, that, you know, Russians were coming in, people from all over Europe were coming in, the numbers were nowhere near what they are now, but you never saw the push towards a bilingual state. I mean, we're talking about the state of Alabama having signs in every grocery store, signs in every pharmacy. You call any bank, you call the cable company, you call the phone company for service, and you have to choose between English and Spanish. I think that is a poor road to go down as a, as a government. We should be a unified country. The goal should be that we're trying to assimilate people, and legal, legal immigration in smaller numbers is something you can assimilate. I personally would like to see a fence all the way across for the money they spend talking and wasting on so many uh, port projects in Washington. I think they could build that fence, and uh, I would like to see the border sealed off, and then we can really deal with the problems. This isn't about race. This isn't about anybody's ethnic background. It is about the law. We are not against immigration. Our job is to stop terrorists and their weapons coming across our borders. While we're doing that, we are encounter illegal immigration. But there is a way to come into the country legally. And if you're not doing that, it is our duty to stop you and make you do things right. For most Latin Americans and for all poor people and all indigenous people who live on communally held lands, there is no line to get into in order to enter the United States legally. America has two basic systems by which a person may cross its borders legally. One system is for Canadians, Western Europeans, and some Eastern Europeans. They may enter with only a passport. Another system is for Latin Americans, Africans, and most Asians. They must have a visa to enter the U.S. legally. Canada um, and Latin America are treated quite differently for immigration purposes. Canadians aren't even considered aliens. They're considered foreign nationals, so they can freely come back and forth from Canada to the United States. Because, as we, as Guatemaltecos, sometimes que que ustedes saben que en muchos países son diferentes que hay países que son bien pobres países que que tienen muchos hay muchas personas de bajos recursos y en la cual el que nosotros somos uno de las cuales que nosotros a veces no calificamos que porque no tenemos no somos empresarios no podemos viajar para acá people who don't own property and are very very poor or live on communally held property um, it is highly unlikely that they could show the strong enough ties to their home country in order to come. The number one reason that people are denied from coming to the United States is because of money. Porque nos hacen un estudio socioeconómico y ven si uno no reúne los requisitos que tengamos uno dinero para venir para acá. En ese tiempo no tenía yo trabajo aquí. In the real estate? Tampoco. The question I get asked most is why don't they come legally? They don't come legally because they can't. There is an exception to America's legal barrier to poor people. It is the H-2A or H-2B guest worker visa. American employers, not foreign workers, request them. In Mobile, Alabama, seafood processors and shipbuilders testified before the Alabama Legislature's Joint Interim Patriotic Immigration Commission that they couldn't find domestic workers or could not afford to continuously employ workers idled during end-of-season lulls. They appealed for more guest worker visas. 
Who owns Mastermind? Mastermind is owned by a company in uh, McLean, Virginia. Is McLean the parent company? Yes. There's another yeah. company on McLean. Nothing owns McLean. Um, you know, uh, can we go off camera for a minute? Bayou Labatry is one of several areas in the United States where Sun Myung Moon and the Family Federation for World Peace and Unification, otherwise known as the Unification Church, have significant holdings. Master Marine is owned by the Unification Church. The Unification Church's finances are mysterious, but the London newspaper The Guardian estimates that Sun Myung Moon's personal worth is $990 million. The issue being raised was Mr. Dungan's representation of Master Marine's financial situation before the Joint Interim Patriotic Immigration Commission. Is Master Marine a financially limited mom-and-pop Alabama shipbuilder with a bona fide need for low-wage imported workers? Is Master Marine part of a global organization with substantial assets which can afford to employ domestic workers even if they must be idle during certain seasons of the year? Mr. Dungan declined to address the question. We've hired American workers, uh, family and non-family, and had, had trouble with them working, uh, not showing up. Uh, you, you know, these, these guys are working in the elements every day in the, in the heat. Uh, in the rain, <laughs> in the rain, uh, and it's hard work. And uh, every American that we've hired has either left before break at 9.30 or not come back. We heard this from agriculture, we heard this from poultry, we heard this from um, large plants on the Gulf Coast, Oyster Group, they were very, very actively um, lobbying us to make sure the economic workforce side of this was met. Forestry was very, very adamant about a workforce need. Last year, we looked at the prevailing wages for tree planters in Alabama, and they tended to be, we looked at Selma, for example, that was uh, $13 an hour. That's what the government sets as the prevailing wage rate that has to be paid to tree planters. We looked at that and we said, surely there is someone in Selma, Alabama, who would be interested in working for $13 an hour plus overtime. That's a pretty decent wage. Uh, Wilcox County, Perry County, uh, Green County, Lowndes County, all of those counties in the Black Belt, Selma, have uh, unemployment rates 12, 14, 15 percent. It would be better to import those people. We've had a lot of supposition, a lot of hyperbola in taking advantage of that particular population, but we've seen very little activity in order to make it happen. But the truth of it is that no one's looking in you know, rural Alabama for these workers. They don't want workers from rural Alabama. They want the guest workers. There's a holler down in yonder hills in the land of the free In the hands that pick the food which fills the belly What we're saying is, if, if the government is going to set up this transnational system of recruitment, then it should hold responsible the people who are benefiting from this system, and that's employers. Sometimes 
para poder salir del país. Me gasté como 7.400 de gastos de camino, comidas, transporte y la visa, como 7.400 mexicanos. Nos endrogamos para, para llegar este, allá a Monterrey. Ahí este, nos metieron en un, en un hotel como de cero estrellas. <ríe> como este, <ríe> estábamos con, como con otras 60 gentes en un solo cuarto. Un solo baño para, para todos. Este, sin agua el baño, por cierto. <ríe> Nos, nos iban a cobrar um, por, este, por llevarnos para allá como mil, mil quinientos dólares. Anteriormente no, hasta mitad de temporada regresaban 160 dólares a mitad de temporada. Y pues era muy, muy poco para lo que se gastaba. El problema con el, el sistema H2A es que los trabajadores van con una expectativa de mejorar sus condiciones, pero como van bajo un contrato, se ven forzados a trabajar con un solo patrón, aunque ese patrón no cumpla su lado del contrato, a no pagarles, por ejemplo, el salario mínimo u otros beneficios que les corresponden, o obligándolos a trabajar excesivamente y, y estos trabajadores se les, se les obliga diciéndoles que si no hacen este trabajo, les pueden cancelar la visa. Bueno, la razón es de que, pues aquí trabajamos a la labor y pues no es suficiente para sostener la familia. Por eso, pues decidimos ir a los Estados Unidos. Mi papá se iba por necesidad, no por gusto. Y pues aquí no hay muchas oportunidades de trabajo, por eso mismo lo hacía y pues sí, fue que okay que un padre se vaya y deje a su familia. No, 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 no nos pagaban por horas, nos pagaban nada más por el puro contrato. Y a veces nos faltaban cajas de verdura, teníamos una cuenta y salían menos en la cuenta del, del checador. Pues a la semana son unos 70, 80 dólares, ya al final de temporada pues era bastante. Creo que eran como 25 mil pesos mexicanos. Sí, porque pues, en, eh, nos habían hecho un papel pues, de que nos iban a pagar nosotros por, por hora. Y ya resultando que ya empezamos a trabajar allá y todo, y pues no, la verdad no. Sí, pues era... Cada viernes nos daban el papel. En la huerta pues, ya hasta nos lo daban. De lo que íbamos a... la cantidad que íbamos a regresar. No, pues ya hasta se sentía re feo regresarlo, porque pensaba uno que era todo para él, para uno pues, el dinero, pero bueno, a veces nos tocaba regresar más de la mitad, el dinero. Bueno, pues ese, el, se supone que la empresa para la que trabaja este señor, este, supone que él este, está pagando el, conforme a la ley, legalmente, este, el, el salario mínimo se supone que es, este, entonces, para, yo me imagino que el, el señor este que nos tenía contratado para no tener problemas como legales o no sé, este, pues él aparentaba que, que nos pagaba el salario mínimo y, este, y, y como nos lo depositaban al, al banco, este, nos, él mismo nos llevaba en el autobús a, a cobrar el dinero al banco y al salir del banco, este, y pues ya supuestamente nos habían pagado legalmente, pero él este, estaba, con, nomás estiraba la mano al, al subir el, al autobús y decía, tú nada más hiciste tanto en la semana, te toca tanto y la diferencia de, de lo que te cobraste en el banco, eso es para mí, no tienes que regresar. Y nos quitaba esa parte. Más del 50% de lo, de lo que ganábamos nosotros. No, pues él nos amenazaba y nos decía que si no regresábamos el, el dinero, o sea, lo que tenía anotado en su libreta, pues que um, nos iba a mandar pues para México. Pues desde que metimos la demanda, ya no aparecemos en la lista para ir para allá a trabajar con ellos. 
Were there workers in the fields with you who were not contract workers? En ese tiempo éramos puros contratados. Después, al final de temporada, ya había muchos ilegales. En los últimos años ya hubo ilegales. Pero anteriormente éramos puros contratados. I'm very interested in the fact that the undocumented workers would come in at the end and they would be given the best fields. There's a benefit there to the employer, and I'm trying to understand what that benefit is. El beneficio de ellos era que ellos les pagaba más barato. Si era por horas, les pagaba $6.50 a la hora. Y por contrato, yo creo que igual que a nosotros, a $0.55 centavos la caja. Pero pienso que había, había más preferencia para ellos. What you see is workers who incur enormous amounts of debt to get to the United States and are paying off those debts at very high interest rates to fairly scary loan sharp types um, who are in their home countries where their spouses and children live, get to the United States who have the option of working only for one employer. And so if that employer turns out not to have a lot of work or not to pay what's promised or not to pay legal wages, the worker has very little recourse. The worker can't work anywhere else and as a practical matter, he cannot go home because of the debt. And that is a recipe for abuse. There's just no doubt about it. That is a bad system. Entonces estamos advertiendo toda la gente que cuando echan el spray porque se muere el retoño del tabaco, no, ellos no pueden sprayar a un kilómetro por el mal olor del, del spray. Hubo files que que andaba uno cortando el retoño y no se lava uno las manos bien o te queda un, un aroma que en vez de comer llegas a vomitar. Hubo una vez el patrón esparalló cerca de cerca de, de no, como 20 personas cortando el retoño. Yo les dije a ellos y muchos les dije, eh, ya, ya bueno, porque yo tengo mucho tiempo trabajo trabajo, ya llega muy cerca. Andaba cerca de él, ya casi no le echaba. Y cerquita con un mexicano, también de los, de los mojados, se paró cerquita y dijo, no, pasa nada, no sean miedosos, no, le dimos huele bien feo, se siente una mareada. Y ya otro día se pusieron mal los tres muchachos, no pudieron, no pudieron trabajar más. Y dijo, y otro día, dije, ¿qué? Dijo, ya nos corrieron, que déjenme las camas porque van a venir otros. Entonces el siguiente día, cortamos de vuelta, pero ya muchos nos sentían, yo me sentí mal. Corpimos el corte de vuelta, cortar tabaco y cortar toño. Ese día yo, ese día me tocó a mí, a dos nos tocó, cortar el toño. Pero yo sentía que no era yo, yo me palanqueaba porque me daba el aire y me dijo, no, yo me llamo Peña, me decía, señor, no calles, sálgase. Dije, yo no, yo quiero trabajar, yo tengo mi niño. Pues entré de vuelta al sur y, y cortar los otoño nomás es, eh, no, es, eh, no es difícil, es fácil. Pero lo malo es que uno se siente bien mal. Agarraba, agarraba la mata y me quedaba y me hincaba. Cortaba el otoño y me dijo, salte, está bien malo. Me salí un palo grande, me, dormí, me acosté, me, a ver si me, me fueron a echar agua, y me, me echaron agua y me sentí, a ver cómo me sentía, me sentí bien. Me escondieron para que me reforzara a bote, a dos. Me reforcé, me levanté a trabajar de vuelta y me cortaron el tiempo, me dijo que me iban a cortar el tiempo. Un mayor de mí me iba a cortar el tiempo. Pues sí que no, al siguiente día, de los disciplinados, los 17, cayeron todos, nomás quedamos cinco. Todos en una vuelta de surco, caigo, se quedaba. Me voy a todos, ay, unos en los pinos, en, escarbaba la tierra para meterse con lo caliente de la tierra. De esos cinco nos dijo la verdad, no sirve, no vale para nada, alárguense para México. A nosotros nos llega más gente. Cortaba, me quedaba vincado que yo sentía que la tierra estaba temblando, yo sentía que me caía. Me dijo, 
párate. No puedo. ¿Y para qué no me miraron? ¿Para qué no me corrieron? Mi encargo. Se va con tantas ilusiones de hacer algo aquí. Y pues no, no son unas cosas fáciles. Este, regresa uno. Eh, yo creo que peor, porque pues ya todo lo que, lo que vive uno desde que sale, este, dejar a la familia, todo. Y para nada. Los niños siempre tienen ilusiones de cómo vienen del norte. Papi, ¿qué me traes? No me traes nada. No, a veces no me podía ver niño. A veces me podía la droga que yo le debía, de todo lo que de ver a ellos, de que yo tengo mi familia en la escuela, de todo. That's why we have said again and again that people who are calling for guest worker programs to be the model for immigration reform need to look at the programs we have. They need to look at what these programs look like in practice. Because what they look like in practice is perilously close to indentured servitude and human trafficking. I mean, that is the system that we have. You want to, it, we can move from having 125,000 people to having a few million people in that condition, but I don't think the condition would change. It, it varies from country to country, the, the, uh, um, the, the amount of the population that's indigenous. But for instance, Guatemala is heavily indig indigenous. Mexico, especially southern Mexico, is heavily indigenous. The unfortunate reality is the more indigenous you are, the less wealth you have, the less political power you have. Usually they would be denied before they were ever even processed, you know, beyond the uh, consular level. In the last maybe 15 years, uh, probably coinciding more than anything with the passing of NAFTA, we have begun to receive rather large numbers of indigenous people from the southern parts of Mexico and from Central America. They come with very little money, which means that when they cross, they are paying the very cheapest guides, which means that there are more days walking in the desert. So they have very little sense of geography. They'll land in Douglas, Arizona, for example, after crossing through Agua Prieta, and knock at the priest's door and say, uh, can you tell me how to get to Florida? Thinking that it's a couple of days walk or not far. Sufrimos mucho pues por ahí, con la, ahí pues el desierto, ahí la migra pues está grande gente y ahí, Tortillas de costada, lo que trae, pues lo quitó ahí, lo agarró ahí, la migra, pues, y no, no tienen de comer, pues. Gracias a Dios que llegué bien ahí mi pueblo y no trae nada. Indigenous peoples are being pushed off ancestral, communally held lands in Mexico, Central America, and South America. They are being pushed through other indigenous peoples' lands. Estimates are that of the 2,000 migrants who try to cross the border every day, 1,500 pass through the lands of the To'ono O'odham Nation. Most of the nation is in Pima County, Arizona. The To'ono O'odham Nation, ground zero for migrant deaths, ground zero 
for indigenous migrant deaths. The nation is undergoing an intertribal dispute over migrants. On one side are tribal leaders who say 1,500 migrants a day are causing severe environmental and religious damage to sacred land. They forbid placing water for migrants on the reservation. On the other side are members like Mike Wilson who disobey the injunction. When I encounter migrants, you see the face of the dispossessed. You see the face of the marginalized. You see the, the face of the unloved, of the unclean. You see the face of poverty. And you multiply that 2,000 times over. My battle is not against Thawna Autumn people. My battle is against the government of the Thawna Autumn nation, which has the resources, has the manpower, and has casino profits to create its own water distribution program, the width and length of the Thawna Autumn nation. When I was the late pastor in cells, my session was asking me very critically, Pastor, shouldn't you be teaching and modeling us how to obey all federal, state, and local civil laws? And why are you aiding and abetting criminal activity and criminals? Because by legal definition, they are all illegal. And my response to them was, as your pastor, if I must decide between a legalistic code and a universal moral code, which one must I obey? God's children are dying. Your brothers and sisters in Christ are dying. Men, women, children, infants, and pregnant women are dying in the desert. Which law must I follow? They don't want to acknowledge a moral question. They don't want to acknowledge a biblical mandate. That I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me water. Because if they acknowledge the moral question, they must acknowledge a moral responsibility. And they don't want to do that. It's easier to let them die. Politician, you got to make a big decision and about the state of things. Well, one thing that we don't want here in the sand is just another, is another Birmingham, is another burning Birmingham. Del cruzar a las vías del tren casi nos llevó un día. ¿Por qué? Porque te, es un pueblo y que te tiene, entre el día te tienes que ocultar. En la noche tratar de que sea el tren. Y, es un, y está la migración y hay perros. Arizona, some people say, is the new Alabama, the epicenter of an intense struggle in which every day 2,000 people illegally try to cross a rigid demarcation line where thousands of other people try to stop them. I, I remember that we were going through those long grass that poked and, and it was all over me and it, and it was poking me. I was scared because I used to be afraid of the dark. Alabamians continue to invoke the memory of the four little girls who died in the bombing of Birmingham's 16th Street Baptist Church in 1963. In Arizona, the new Alabama, at least four little girls have died because of inherently violent economic policies and a brutal militarized border.
Olivia Luna Nogueira was an 11-year-old girl whose body was found on the territory, on the land of the Tohono O'odham Nation in southern Arizona in July 2006. When authorities found her, her body temperature was 106 degrees. She was wearing pink sneakers. She was traveling with her 16-year-old sister. They were trying to um, reach a suburb of Atlanta, Georgia, to join their parents who had been living there for a number of years. And what makes this death, for me at least, especially tragic is her youth, and also the way that many people responded to it. A number of people blamed the parents, asking what type of parents would force their child, right, force their children, to cross such harsh terrain. Right? But I think that's the wrong question. I think the question we need to ask is, what type of society forces parents to make that choice? En el 92, cuando salí, me acuerdo que cruzábamos mi esposo y yo a pie por el hoyo, sin ningún problema para cruzar. Cruzamos como si nada, cruzamos parados. No tuvimos ni siquiera que agacharnos para poder cruzar la línea. Era... All migrants risk their lives and their families' property to cross borders illegally. With the increasing militarization of the border beginning in 1993, Crossing has steadily become more dangerous, more expensive, and more humiliating. How much did you pay your career debt? $2,000. Los del Salvador sí pagamos $6,000, $5,000. dollars para venir a llegar hasta aquí en este país y el dinero me costó bastante porque me estafaron. Y si no se los dábamos, nos iba él a regresarnos. Y cómo se iban a regresar si ya estaban metidos en deudas? que nuestra familia luchó. Mi suegra tuvo que dar los papeles de su casa para poder yo estar aquí y vendí una mi moto que tenía y vendí este un terreno para poder llegar hasta aquí. Cuando llegamos a México, después de cruzar dos fronteras, El Salvador, Guatemala, Guatemala, México, llegamos a un lago. Allí tuvimos que abordar dos lanchas. Fue un momento difícil porque nos dividieron en grupos diferentes. Un grupo pasó, el otro no pasó debido a que la lancha volteó. Compañeros murieron. Luego tienes que abordar un trailer donde nos meten a 130 personas por 28 horas desde Tabasco hasta Puebla. Este, desde Guatemala vienen este, pagando dinero, vienen pagando cuotas para, para la mala salvatrucha, para los guardias del tren. Si no pagan la cuota, este, los tiran del tren o los, los pueden as asesinar. Venía una mujer eh, de Centroamérica con su bebé en brazos en la parte de arriba del tren. La venció el cansancio. Este, pero iba a la orilla del tren, se quedó dormida y su bebé se le cayó, se le cayó del tren. Y cuando pudo bajarse, el bebé ya no lo encontró. Cuando nos subimos al tren y nos escondimos en el baño, cinco personas amontonados, con un calor sufocante, con el ruido, eso es siempre, el ruido del motor siempre, porque estás dentro, dentro de la máquina. El pito, las paradas, ese pito que conocemos todos, lo escuchas fuerte. Y ahí viajamos, hicimos acerca como casi entre 10 horas, desde el río Texas a San Antonio. Eh, había veces que no había comida para, para darle a mi hija más grande, porque no había trabajo y muchas veces comía una sola vez al día. Entonces ella tenía un dolor muy fuerte en su estómago casi siempre y yo la llevaba con doctores y, y no, no, no la aliviaban porque no era necesidad de medicina, sino de buena alimentación. Entonces al yo salir embarazada, mi segunda niña tenía casi siete meses cuando me dijeron que mi bebé, que quizás uh, mi bebé iba a nacer de su, de su cabeza muy grande y de su cuerpo muy pequeño. Y me dijo, no, hay muchas probabilidades de que tu bebé 
viva. Mi esposo y yo platicamos esa noche y decidimos, decidimos irnos, cruzar a Estados Unidos. Venía una señorita de como de aproximadamente 18 años y los ladrones lo que hicieron empezaron a violarla delante de nuestros ojos. Y la señorita nos empezó, nos empezó a gritar que la ayudáramos, que la ayudáramos. Y nosotros nos íbamos a levantar a ayudarla, pero arriesgaba nuestra vida que nos mataran. Decidimos aventarnos a la aventura. Nos vinimos a la orilla de la línea. Ah, había, unas, había unos carros aplastados. Había tres carros que nos sirvieron como escalera para poder cruzar a Estados Unidos. En, en el brinco sí, sí habían aparecido dos chamaquitos que andaban ahí viendo a ver qué podían arrebatarle a las personas que brincaban el muro. Sí le quitaron a mi marido la mitad de lo que él llevaba. Él agarró a la niña en el brazo, la niña más grande, y con un brazo se resbaló hacia abajo. Estaba casi cuatro metros o, much, o cinco metros de, de altura. Pues solamente me encomendé a Dios y, y brinqué él también. Me acuerdo que acomodé mi estómago por un lado y e hice esto. Agarré el tubo y me abracé de él. Como tardé tanto por estar embarazada, no pude hacer las cosas rápido, me agarraron. Y que veníamos 20 y, y no acabía en ese carro, tuvieron que montar uno sobre otro. En una expedición, como hora y media. Los niños que venían, venían llorando porque no aguantaban. Después nos llevaron al desierto, en medio del desierto, y nos dejaron ahí. Y después vino un carro y nos llevó así. Yo estaba enfrente en el carro, el del lado del, del, este, del copiloto y abajo. Y fue, fueron como 10 horas de ahí para Phoenix. Y tenía también ella mucho miedo porque tenía miedo de que si chocábamos ella se iba a romper el cuello porque estaba muy apretada con mi hermano. Cuando ve, veíamos el río, el río Bravo que le llaman, como si que también las fuerzas y el ánimo se nos acabó porque el río era muy grande. Cuando pasamos nadando el río grande, al otro lado eh, los los coyotes que nos traían cruzando el río se llevaron nuestra ropa a un lugar seguro y nos hicieron caminar en puras espinas, caminando descalzos, sin zapatos, sin nada. Y dolía mucho las espinas, desnudos. Corrimos bastante, corrimos bastante porque cerquita de nosotros estaba migración. The helicopters come really low and shine their lights and they call it dusting and stir up all the dirt around the person to get them all scared and running, and especially if they're in a large group, people get lost from their group. That's the most dangerous thing when they get lost from their group. Algo que desconocen los migrantes al, al llegar al altar este, son las condiciones. Muchos de ellos no saben lo que es un desierto. Difícilmente lo sabemos nosotros que vivimos en él, ellos no lo saben. Por ejemplo, las, las temperaturas en, en invierno este, fácilmente caen por debajo de los cero grados. Este, y en, en verano eh, sobrepasan este, los 125 Fahrenheit a la sombra. Expuestos al sol se incrementa de 5 a 10 centígrados más. Eh, las plantas en el desierto de Arizona en algunos lugares no crecen más de un metro, lo, lo cual es casi imposible cubrirse del sol. Cuando, cuando corren se pierden muy fácilmente. Al perderse no saben dónde, a dónde caminar. Y el único punto que tienen para orientarse es el sol. Y muchos de ellos siguen al sol cuando se está ocultando. Si seguimos al sol cuando se está ocultando, nos estamos introduciendo más en el desierto, donde es casi imposible sobrevivir. Dice ser coyote, dice saber las rutas, pero no se las sabe. Y están tonteando en el desierto, no, no saben realmente a dónde van. Por eso mucha gente se pierde y se desaparece en el desierto.
violan a las señoritas y cuando vienen al camino que le vienen exigiendo si no me vas a dar tal cosa yo te voy a matar, si no me vas a dar tal cosa te voy a dejar botada en el camino, si no me vas a dar eso te voy a dejar tirada y por eso es que las señoritas por temor le dan lo que él les pide. I was a little bit scared because uh, in the desert there's uh, lizards and, uh, uh, and snakes. Al llevar como una hora, una hora aproximadamente, una hora y media de, de caminar, eh, nos asaltaron. Yo iba siguiendo al coyote porque pues, yo no lo quería perder. Luego de... que con eso sí me pongo así como que, you know. Ok, luego de, de eso, eh, pues el coyote llevaba a mi niño y lo bajó y lo llamaron nada más a él. Yo me fui para ahí, caminando atrás de él pues porque no lo, no lo quería perder y me dijeron de que me regresara y nos pusieron a todos en una fila, en una fila recta y una persona empezó a, a revisar las maletas de todos y otra persona nos estaba apuntando con una pistola y la otra persona estaba revisando a, a todos uno por uno. Luego de, de eso, eh, pues en ese, en ese momento sí sentí mucho miedo porque pensé que nos iban a hacer algo. Y yo dije que, pues, que a, la, a la hora de que me fueran a llamar a mí, pues mis niños se podían poner a llorar y los podían golpear por lo mismo o, o les podían hacer algo peor. Me dijo que para qué la había traído, que, que ya no me había dicho que la trajera, que mejor la hubiera dejado con su abuelito. Almirante se le ha dicho que tenga mucho cuidado cuando que vaya a cruzar el desierto los peligros que pueda suceder. En el desierto la persona puede fallecer por falta de agua, eh, por falta de comida. De lo peligroso es que se viene uno del camino y si traes comida pues está bien pasar y si es todos esos montañas, cerro y si, si, si ahí se cava la fuerza o lo que traes pues se lo deja uno atrás y se muere uno y pues se queda uno atrás y ya no puede seguir adelante. Fue una experiencia grata, bonita en el sentido de que cuando crucé la frontera la temperatura estaba completamente fría. Era la medianoche. Parece raro que les diga que es bonito. ¿verdad? Pero todo eso me ayudó para cuando llegara aquí. Porque cada día recordaba esa noche. Cuando muchas personas no lograron cruzar. Cruzar el desierto, al cruzar el desierto, los mexicanos, antes de hacerlo, llenan una mochila con cosas, con ropa, con comida, con agua, con lo necesario para poder sobrevivir. Pero adentro de esa mochila también llevan todos sus sueños y todas sus esperanzas. 
yo lo necesitaba para hacer mi, para sacar adelante a mi familia y por ser mi casa, tener mis propias cosas. Y por tener mis propias cosas, por tener algo en la casa, tener mi propio techo y tener lo que... Tengo una familia con un hijo con siete meses y quería sacarlo adelante. You find all kinds of things out here. You find Bibles, you find little doilies and things they brought from home, letters. I found a, a bottle of cologne one time and it was called Courage. You find little kid backpacks and little mirrors and little, you know, tubes of lipstick or things that they left behind. We find we find uh, birth certificates and driver's licenses, and things that look important, photographs, pictures of people with no names on the back, so we can't even return them to whoever they belong to. Cuando cuando ellos no pueden cruzar, cuando ellos abandonan la mochila en el desierto. Muchos de ellos también abandonan sus sueños y sus esperanzas junto con todo. So the fact that people are trying to come to the United States to access certain rights, right? and the fact that the, the border has to be increasingly militarized in order to deny them from realizing those rights, is an example of how this, what we might call a violence of foundation, an original act of violence, translates into a violence of conservation. The militarization of the U.S.-Mexico border began in conjunction with NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. According to the U.S. Immigration and Naturalization Service's 1994 Southwest Border Strategy, increased border militarization would be a deterrent to illegal migration. The strategy included making crossings so difficult and costly that fewer individuals would try. In other words, migrants would be pushed away from the relative safety of crossing through urban areas and into more and more remote areas. Limited numbers would die, word would get back to Mexican communities, and migrants would stop trying to cross. In part, the INS border strategy was based on its 1993 conclusion that throughout the following decade, illegal migration would increase as a result of the implementation of NAFTA. So the very fact that we have people from Mexico and beyond now trying to come to what's today the southwest of the United States against the dictates of the U.S. federal government has translated into this militarization apparatus that we've seen explode over the last 15 years. We now have 18,000 Border Patrol agents. It's scheduled to, to grow to 20,000 over the next year. Right? In effect, you have what a lot of people in the Southwest describe as an occupying army right? um, that is there to maintain the conquest right? and what goes along with it, this denial of rights to anyone who would challenge that conquest by, for example, trying to cross the U.S.-Mexico boundary without authorization to find work or to reunite him or herself with, with their families. More migrants die crossing Arizona than anywhere else along the U.S. border. But prior to 1997, no one kept records of migrant deaths. Since 1997, about 5,000 migrant bodies have been recovered from the American Southwest. If this figure is accurate, it means that more people have died crossing the U.S.-Mexico border than died as a result of the September 11th terrorist attacks and Hurricane Katrina combined. Well, the typical story that we get from those who are traveling with an individual who has died crossing the de desert is, is not a very uh, happy tale. Generally, it's an individual who uh, progressively becomes more disoriented, confused, ill, meaning with nausea and vomiting and eventually will just simply collapse. Uh, the, the death is, is not one where someone is just okay one minute and, and deceased the next. It seems to be, to be a great deal of suffering involved. 
the new border enforcement strategy that began in 94, their theory was that once the word got out about how hazardous that crossing would be, and particularly the, the increasing numbers of deaths of migrants would be a deterrent to other people trying to cross. They were successful in sealing off the urban areas of the border, the traditional areas of migration. And they were right, people began to die. Uh, and they began to maintain statistics in 97. The, the number of deaths became significant enough for the United States government to begin to, to keep those statistics. Uh, the official numbers are somewhere between four and 5,000 people. Uh, that's not an accurate statistic because people are dying in very remote, isolated areas of the, of the desert. Caminando como, 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 como tres, tres noches caminando. Y ahí pues este, lo vi un cuerpo pues estaba muerto pues, cabeza, el brazo, costilla del muerto se murió ahí desierto. Y yo también pues le tengo miedo pues cuando me vi de eso. That migrants that we talk to uh, keep telling us of coming across bodies and coming across bones and coming across skeletons. This is the second cooler that we built to accommodate the overflow of border crosser deaths that we have. Generally, these people can be here for months and sometimes even years as we attempt to identify them. Uh, and this cooler provides that long-term storage. Estoy muy cansado y tengo mucha sed. Estoy adolorido con ampollas en mis pies. Ayúdame, Señor. de allá de, de no es mi pueblo pero de Oaxaca pues se murió este por por decir que, que llegó bien allá de, de donde fue pues y me dijo el coyote yo no sé a dónde a, a dónde se fue y no no lo vi y, que, que no 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 sabe pero ahí ahí está testigo pues dice que se murió la muchacha pero no no hasta ahorita tiene como como 28 años y, eh, tiene con, con un, un niño nada más this death toll and all of the suffering, that is a gross violation of human rights in everybody's estimate, except the United States government's. In the last decade, there have been more than 5,000 people dead. And it is becoming the biggest grave in all the world. The death toll in the last decade has been
couple of years ago, a migrant died almost in the back door of the Baptist church in cells. And nobody said a word. You would think it was a stray dog that died. All right, everybody, there you have it, the second cooler. Had a very lively chat for that, obviously a very powerful film. Gets very intense at the end, as I promised. And uh, let's welcome, without further ado, the filmmaker herself, Ellen Jimerson. Ellen, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for letting us screen the movie. I hope you... uh, enjoyed watching a very lively chat through that uh, as you can I see i actually did not watch the chat oh okay. because i was oh, trying did. to uh i hadn't seen the movie in a while and i wanted to make get it fresh in my mind plus anyway i i didn't well that's okay. bad, I mean, I hop over there and look at it well one thing that i probably should have mentioned when we introed the film is that this was not a trump era doc this was actually shot a long time ago. It came out in 2013, but as your postscript mentioned, you were in post-production on this in 2009. So when did you actually shoot the film? When did you actually get the footage and do the Right, interviews? I'm glad you brought that up because um, the figures were current in 2008. So ah. I did one round of shooting in 2008 and then did another round of shooting in 2011. So, uh, and I saw so a couple of updates. Uh, at the end, John Fife says the official figure for recovered migrant remains is in the neighborhood of 5,000. But now mm-hmm. uh, that figure has grown to at least 8,000. And as Uh, border watchers believe the real number likely is three times that, which would make it 24,000. And it's only in Arizona, to the best of my knowledge, that these figures are kept. So uh, the major crossing area has shifted to Texas. Um, So plenty of people have died there, some in New Mexico and, of course, California. 
So any, nobody, it's anybody's guess as what the uh, actual figures are. All right. Well, we're going to start taking some questions from the chat if you guys have any. Uh, but while you're formulating those, um, I'll, I'll start by just asking about the title of the movie. As a filmmaker myself, I always was sort of, I always knew I had something when I had a title for something. And, you know, mm -hmm. I would usually think of a title before I started or, you know, it wasn't until I found the title that worked that I thought I really had something in. Mm -hmm. What's really, really effective right at the beginning of the movie is we learn what the second cooler is. Most, wow. Almost, wow. almost no audience members would go into this knowing what the title is actually in yeah. reference to. And then we learn very quickly within about a minute uh, of the film uh, that it refers to that is the name they give to this sort of spillover morgue. Mm -hmm. And that's just a very harrowing, haunting moment right off the bat. It really works mm -hmm. as a hook. Um, when did you find out what the second cooler was and was that your title going in? I'm always curious to know that. Um, uh, uh, we went to the Pima County Medical Examiner's office on that first round of shooting in 2008. And um, that's when uh, the examiner there just sort of offhandedly said, this is, this is what we refer to as the second cooler. Um, but going into it, and it took me a while to sort of figure out that that was the title going into it. I had, and my, and Rosa Toussaint, who was my uh, pr producer, co-producer at the time, uh, we had come up with the name Desconocida because Desconocida is how um, Mexicans refer to those who, who's, uh, who have not been identified. They're unidentified. The first person mm -hmm. that year that was unidentified was a woman. So Desconocida. But it was just kind of somebody said it sounds like a soap opera. And I'm like, well, that's not what I'm going for. But uh, it was it soon stuck in my mind that the second cooler was the title. Yeah, absolutely. Russell, did you and have I anything? have to uh, I want oh, to shout ahead. out um, my consulting producer who took a look at it um, well into it. His name is Hank Rogerson, and he's just a wonderful filmmaker and he so many people just donated their time to me. I had never made a film before. I don't even have a film to record my kids, you know, I mean, a camera. Right. Um, so his name is Hank Rogerson. He um, did a documentary called Shakespeare Behind Bars. If you've heard uh, of that. Very, I haven't heard of that. Very nice about, uh, about prisoners who get involved in producing Shakespearean plays. And another one called Still Dreaming about... Uh, actors in an old folks home so anyway shout out to hank for suggesting to me i forgot what i was talking about uh that i put the bit about the second cooler right at the beginning because i had saved it all to the end but he said no you got to give them a little taste no it works so well right mm -hmm. right at right off the bat yeah it, it, it works absolutely mm -hmm. it sets everything up yeah uh, Russell, did you have any question for Ellen before we go to the chat? We got a couple coming in here. Yeah, we talked a little bit about this uh, before we went on. Um, I think what was really interesting here, and I think it's a perspective that most people don't have, even people on the left, is that NAFTA screwed Mexicans as well. I think most of us think that it raised their wages or that it did improve their economic conditions, just not enough and not for everyone, but that overall it was the American worker who took the brunt of the consequences because they had the higher wages to begin with. So did you know that going in or was it something you discovered as you, as you made the film? No, before I, I ever started making the film, I had, I was, just like what's going on here you know with i was hearing people talking about other human beings the way i had not heard people talk about other human beings since i was a child in uh the segregated south and my fam my parents were civil rights activists and i was just like what's going on here people don't just up and decide to come illegally for no reason so i had gone to the border and had talked to a lot of people um 
And one of the things that was just emphasized with me was NAFTA. Mm-hmm. Um, I went to a shelter across the border in uh, Agua Prieta, uh, which is just across the border from Douglas. And it's a shelter they they call the the Center for Attention to Migrants in Exodus. And they were so knowledgeable. We were talking and I, you know, a migrant came in and anyway, we, everybody who was working there just got and sat with me and sat with us. And um, I said something like, what did NAFTA have to do with this? By that time I was writing an article for the newspaper. So I was in the questioning mode and listening mode and not chattering mode. Um, and and the nun there, she it just made her so angry even to think about it. You know, she said NAFTA just, you know, it was about, uh, it, it just infuriated her. And everybody there seemed to know what was going on. This is a church run institution. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And the priest had said, you can't just minister them to them by giving them a chicken and a bottle mm-hmm. of orange soda. You've got to know what's going on, what's happening to mm-hmm. them, which was just, uh, of course, I've never before since seen much of anything like that in a church uh, institution where you have to understand the politics and the economics. But she was also talking about, um, you know, with, with with the lifting of Article Twenty Four of the Mexican Constitution, right. that um, and I knew nothing about that. Yeah, and that was that was a condition for Mexico to enter into uh-huh. the NAFTA. And so, not only was it about the corn and beans, but you know you can't talk about everything in one documentary, but it was about access to aquifers. Um, so it was. I mean, she just was just a font of knowledge that was just one woman but um it just uh no i i, I knew the storyline uh when i went when when I, when I got the idea to do it it was almost a spur of the moment thing well and and you know this kind of deep dive and i i would love to see an update of this based on so much has happened since that with the Trump years and the children cages and the exploding migrant crisis and, and well that's uh, yeah know, that's... sending sending the immigrants to New York and to DC yeah and I don't uh, I've never seen anything quite like this because even the left take on it the left has been so hobbled by the jargon of postmodernism that even when they're right, they sound like they're wrong, I think, to a lot of people. You know, the way that they talk about all this right. is purely and in terms of identity because it, they've lost the language of economics. They really don't talk about but it's it also, on the level this gets into it. It's also where I like y'all so much um, because you're different from mainstream media. And as I've said before, there's not one thing I knew or had access to other than people to give me interviews that the New New York times NPR democracy now did not have in 2008. And it just infuriates me. I went to the border. I started talking to Mexicans and I started talking to uh, people who put water out in the desert. And, you know, I went around looking for people to talk to. Uh uh There's not one thing, one thing I've ever had access to that they didn't have access to and they didn't talk about it all through. So I was editing in 2009 and that's when Obama was elected. He was there for eight years. There was no reporting Uh on, and there still has been no reporting on migrant deaths to make, to make a difference. There was kids in cages began with Obama. Obama signed more free trade agreements. Obama was all about securing the border. Um, there was nothing Trump did that Obama didn't do first, but it was only when Trump was elected that suddenly the New York Times, NPR, Democracy Now! woke up. And I literally, I have people, I know people in Tucson, one of whom is a journalist you really should have on sometime, whose name is Todd Miller, 
and another friend, uh, Joel Smith, who lent me a lot of the photographs that you see of, of articles he has recovered from the desert. He puts water out in the desert. Uh -huh. um, and one of them contacted Democracy Now! and one of them contacted NPR and said, you have got to, why aren't you covering this? People are dying out here because of a federal policy that's funneling people to their deaths. Um, you know, at least eight, uh, the remains of 8,000 migrants have been recovered just from Arizona. Why aren't you covering this? They knew people down there told them, made sure they knew. Sure. So it's, it's a mainstream media problem. Um, I did hop over to the chat for one second and saw, you know, racism. Yeah, racism has something to do with it, but that's not the that's not the crux of the matter. It's capitalism. I don't think so. Neoliberalism. Um, it's it's just, and it doesn't matter. You know, the damage done to the environment. None of that matters as long. As, so, Mexico. Yeah. Uh, NAFTA uh, created eight or 10 or 12 Mexican billionaires and displaced millions uh. of people. Uh, and it's not just corn and beans, but it's, it's small producers. Otherwise, small business people were dislocated. I'm going to go to Cricket from the chat here. Thanks, Cricket. He asks, how do people get identified? I'm wondering if you know about that, because then he follows that up with an interesting question uh, after that. Do they take pictures? Because you can't imagine they'd care enough to use DNA testing. No. So. Um, it, before DNA testing, they just, um, you know, if somebody had ID on them, you know, sometimes they will have ID. Sometimes they will lo lose their ID crossing the Rio Grande or, you know, they they lose it. Um, so it would just take, you know, basically just um, people searching and, you know, putting two and two together. But now that DNA is possible, they are locating um, family members uh, and identifying them with DNA. Excellent. My dad has a comment and a fifty dollars. Thank you, Dad, for the donation. Yeah. Powerful. Thank you. Thank you. It's good, good feedback. Uh, there are lots of great feedback uh, in the chat. I'll, I'll just show some, some you know immediate reactions here, saying you know how powerful they thought the film was. Obviously, pretty proletarian. Thank you for sharing. Um, Benjamin, fantastic documentary, very relevant to our time. So nothing but, uh, nothing but praise. And obviously we had quite a few people say this oh. sentiment because that, that postscript at the end really hits hard. It hit hard when yeah. I watched it. And, um, yeah, I appreciate, yeah, I appreciate you saying it. Sure thing. Sure thing. Uh, um, all let right. me go. my, my, uh, my pandemic Spanish is not good enough to read that. Do you speak Spanish, Ellen? A little. Do, okay, we'll I don't put this up anything. on the screen. Yep, I see that one. Well, we'll put that up. Let me just go to Ryan for a second, because Ryan was here for the for the duration. Thank you for sticking around, Ryan, and thank you for the donation. Do you think we should fund securing the border like build a wall, or do you think it's a waste of resources and effort, and why? It's an horrendous waste of resources. It is the militarization of the border that has been done deliberately to cost people their lives. And um, it, it, I mean, it's all part of uh, our fascination with militarization. I mean, you go down on the border now and it's, it's the, um, the uh, panels left over from the Gulf War. It's high um, high tech cameras, uh, stadium lights, police dogs. It's all the things that it, it. And there's only one purpose: that's to make people's lives miserable, and uh, to line the pockets of employers. 
And, and not only that, but it's do doing tremendous ecological harm. Yes. There was, back when the first Bush was still president, in a single swoop, um, Michael Chertoff waived in their entirety all sorts of um, environmental, clean air, clean water, migrating birds, but also indigenous uh, land protections. There were like 84 of them in a single swoop. And yeah, one of the first uh, episodes I ever did of this podcast way back, I think this was episode five or six, I interviewed someone who made a documentary, or she was in a documentary called The River and the Wall. And there's all kinds of things you don't think about, but when you build a wall through a desert right near a river, there are a lot of animals who need that river right, for water right, because it's right, in the middle right, of the right, desert. Right, there is no other water. Right, so right. the land animals, if there's a big wall, they can't get there. They die off. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Interesting. Oh, interesting. That's, been, that's been a huge problem all up and down the border. Um, and I don't know if you know now, but the border now extends way out into the Pacific and people are trying to come around that wall out in the Pacific. And of course, some are drowning. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We saw, we well, saw you know, you know, I mean, so, something that strikes me, it was interesting that you interviewed, uh, what was he, a state Senator in Alabama? Yeah, mm -hmm. Scott Beeson. So, so you look at you look at the right wing coverage on this, and they're not wrong that uh, companies and corporations encourage this so that they can basically get indentured servants. That tends to be the right wing take on why this is being allowed, like why we would even want these people here. Um, the part that they miss, and this is what distinguishes them as right wing and us as left wing, is our culpability for the economies and the conditions in those countries that cause these people to want to come here. That they right, do not they deal say, with, but also, you know what, <laughs> as you point out, the NPR doesn't deal with that. The New York Times doesn't deal with that. The Washington Post doesn't deal with that. Mm -mm. We, I think, I think what's shocking to a lot of Americans is we're this modern empire and we were raised on the myth of human rights. We were raised on the myth that we're better. Uh, up until really the 20th century, if you had an empire, of course you exploit the subject nations mm -hmm. under your empire. That's how it works, right? Mm -hmm. You go into India and you take their spices and you dominate their, their country. Mm -hmm. The 20th century, the optics of that became untenable. You can't just send your troops to occupy all of South America. So you do economic imperialism. You send mm -hmm. in the CIA to do coups on any leader who tries to resist your economic domination of their country. Um, and that's something that really, you know, I, the real left talks about that. It's It's an assumed underpinning of our uh, analysis of our relationship mm -hmm. to Central and South America. Mm -hmm. um, but there is no place in what you might term the mainstream media that discusses why these people are coming. It, it tends to be, you know, just kind of vaguely indicated as th these countries are a mess. You know, they just have well, their I mean, governments. Even, are just a even mess. Bernie Sanders was like, if I'm elected president, I'm, I'm going to put together a um, you know, a forum and we're going to figure out what, I mean, <laughs> if I know what the problem is, you don't, you don't need any silly forum, no summit. <laughs> we just need to quit displacing people to begin with. We need to quit overthrowing their democratically elected uh, governments um, like Honduras, you know, uh, Manuel Zelaya had been was democratically elected. He had uh, uh, promoted and instituted quite a few uh, economic reforms, land reforms, indigenous, and of course Hillary Clinton, being on basically on Dole Pineapple's payroll, was like, "We're not having right. this." Right. And so then you get this exodus of these kids 
four years later, five years later, and they're like, well, we know they'd be safer here, but we got to send them back anyway. They're just kids. You know, you think people put their kids on the road? Right, right. I mean, it's just like, no, they're not coming because they want to breathe the free air. No, right. well, that's they're the not thing. coming because they want a better opportunity, even if that's the language they themselves use. They're well, you coming saw some of the conditions there. Right. Sorry, go ahead. Right. You know, they're coming because they're being pushed. They have yeah. Well, in, no, in the film, uh, you saw some of the the housing conditions there. We learned about. I had never known that as a result of NAFTA, a lot of the farm subsidies to Mexican farmers went away, which obviously tightened their margins and drove working conditions down and wages down. Um, it's something, it, it's a side of it that we don't normally see. Um, and meanwhile, meanwhile, while the subsidies from the farmers were, Article 14 was repealed so that Carlos Salinas could sign and get in. Meanwhile, Archer Daniels Midland in the United States, which is this massive factory corn producer, continued to receive subsidies. Now, right. that just, right. I mean, well, it's clear what was going on. It's tells just you who writes the laws, robbery. Right? Pardon yeah. me? It tells you who writes the laws, right? <laughs> yeah, it tells you who writes the laws. Benjamin Reed asks, what is the best strategy to challenge the current Biden administration policy that discriminates against Nicaraguans, Cubans, Haitians, and Venezuelans? Well, I mean, it's just, um, he's, once again, we have a president who's addressing problems that we have been instrumental in creating. Anytime a Latin American or a Caribbean country starts making progress towards uh, democracy and uh, addressing poverty and economies oriented to exports to the United States, yep. we come down on them. So now, yes, they're trying to leave. I, I talked to the last time I went to do some shooting for another project. I talked to Cubans and Venezuelans and, and others. Um, but so the solution is don't come, apply online. But don't come, and then we'll see if you can come in or not, but don't come. The best strategy is for us Democrats to get a grip, to start looking for the truth, start telling the truth, start insisting on the truth, and start looking at our role in all of this and for talking purposes, we need to take racism off the table. We need to talk about who benefits, where the money goes, who's getting rich, who's getting poor. Right. And when you say well, take racism then, well, off the table, I'm assuming you mean it's because that is sort of used as a stand in for is. an actual conversation. Right. I, as yeah, as in so many here. other areas. You know, I mean, this is we've talked about this a lot on the show. Corporations encourage that take in order to avoid conversations like this. You want to say, oh, people don't want them here because they're racist. It, it avoids a this kind of a conversation. Why are they really coming here? What did we do to their countries? I, I want I want to read this because it shows you how old this is. This is a pretty famous quote. A lot of our, our uh, listeners will probably know it. Some might not. This was a famous Marine, uh, Smedley Butler, who went off the reservation um, and spilled the beans on what he did as an officer in the Marine Corps. Um, I spent 33 years and four months in active military service. And during that period, I spent most of my time as a high class muscle man for big business, for Wall Street and the bankers. In short, I was a racketeer, a gangster mm -hmm. for capitalism. 
I helped make Mexico and especially Tampico safe for American oil interests in 1914. I helped make Haiti and Cuba a decent place for the National City Bank boys to collect revenues in. I helped in the raping of half a dozen Central American republics for the benefit of Wall Street. I helped purify Nicaragua for the International Banking House of Brown Brothers in 1902 to 1912. I brought light to the Dominican Republic for the American sugar interests in 1916. I helped make Honduras ripe for the American fruit companies in 1903. In China in 1927, I helped see to it that Standard Oil went on its way unmolested. Looking back on it, I might have given Al Capone a few hints. The best he could do was to operate his racket in three districts. I operated on three continents. So I saw... That's profound. I, I don't know that I had heard that. I saw people in the chat talking about... Uh, America and whether it's done anything good for the world in the last 75 years. And of course, people start talking about World War II. But one of the things that's really interesting about this quote, uh, because I think for a lot of us, we feel like, well, it's after World War II when we created the CIA. That's when we lost our way. Before that, there was this American innocence and we didn't play the British uh, uh, real politic game. And that quote and the timeline of those quotes shows you, no, we've been playing that game for a very long time. Mm. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't suddenly lose our interest, our our innocence in the post-war period. No, no, no. And here's another thing that I wish people, people would talk about more with Hillary Clinton and uh, the pink pussy hats and all of that. I don't think people really think so much about um, the fact that Hillary Clinton, in being so much involved in the overthrow of Manuel Zelaya and, yep. and, in, and in negotiating that um, the largest weapons deal ever with Saudi Arabia, what she's doing is setting up the conditions in which women and girls and boys will be raped. That is setting it up. And uh, Berta Caceres, who was an indigenous leader um, in in Honduras uh, and was working to keep the um, dams out and and holding on to water and so forth, she specifically pointed at Hillary Clinton and said yeah, that I she's remember that. the cause of w- when, when we supported that coup and basically instigated it, we said Honduras spiraling downward into poverty, femicide, um, LGBT persecution and uh-huh. rape, sexual uh-huh. assault goes along with that each yep. and every time. You don't have a yep. war or that kind of thing uh, when people are being displaced and they're not raped. One of the images that you saw in the second cooler that Joel, a uh, picture that Joel took was there's a pair of women's red panties. Yes. There's also a package of... Um, uh, birth t- control pills. It's common for women crossing and girls crossing to get on birth control pills before mm-hmm. they cause, before they try to cross because of the anticipation of what might might happen. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, we can, you know, I just. Um, well, that, I, I, I remember that well, because I used to, I used to drop articles about that on the Hillbots all the time in 2016. Um, and about Honduras, you mean? Yeah, about mm-hmm. um, what was her name? The indigenous leader, Barcelona. Berta. Berta. It, yeah, Oscar. yeah, yeah. And she's I, been assassinated since. And she was assassinated yeah. exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I mean, if you ever argued with the Hillbots, uh, you know, Keaton puts it very well. It's like it's like when you talk to a cat. And they just kind of, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> blank stare back. Well, it's like, yeah. I don't know what's going <laughs> and I want to make sure too that I want to uh, 
put an update on one thing, talking about how much it costs to pay the coyotes to bring them here. It When I shot that in 2008, it was maybe $2,000 from north of Mexico, say Nogales, and uh, six or $7,000 from El Salvador. Now I'm hearing that it is as much as $8,000 from the north of Mexico, from, um, from Nogales wow. and from other places along the border. The prices have skyrocketed. Um, and I had something else that when that I thought was brilliant to say, but I've forgotten it. Um, well, maybe it'll come back. Let me just ask one. Uh, well, let me just keep going down the chat here. Was the film distributed widely in Mexico, or was it screened in Mexico, and was it shown in film festivals here? I know you had some festival laurels on one of the poster mm -hmm. images, so I'm assuming it was it screened at some festivals around here. It. I did not get it into. A, into a uh, festival in Mexico. Uh, I applied to some. The festivals are a thing unto themselves. Um, it, it, it did screen in a festival in Santo Domingo. Oh, okay. But um, <clears throat> the interest of the people putting on the festival was to compete with Sundance. To yeah, have course, big yeah. film, you know, they it weren't really too much interested in the issues, but yeah, mm -hmm. um, it screened, it has screened all over the United States, um, in film festivals and in universities, colleges. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, the, the festivals are 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 always tough for, for that reason, you know, um. But now with streaming and stuff like that, I mean, you have the movie up for free on YouTube. You put it up on YouTube a few months ago. Um, obviously, people can watch it here now. Um, now those those festivals do not hold the keys to the industry the way they used to because you can get around them. You can right. put them online. And let me say that I am available. I didn't bring up my fees with y'all because it, it's a gift and the gift will you've given me more in return than I needed, but I do book universities. I do book anybody who's interested. Uh, there are fees involved, but to if come you, show the film and speak. Yes. So if you need to know or want to know, I, there's a $500 screening fee, a $2,000 fee for me to come and speak and do Q and a, and I'll do anything, you know, I'll teach your criminology class, <laughs> teach your <laughs> ethics class. You, you know. uh, I'll preach. I've done that. Um, and then expenses. I, I have a little wiggle room, but um, yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready to get the show back on the road uh, since COVID. Put it I in. mean, a, a, a follow up would be so timely. You, you mean know, a follow up film? A new or film? Yeah, a follow up oh. on this film. I mean, this is the perfect time to delve into this subject because it seems like the situation is so much worse. And that was so bad at that it, time. Well, it's the thing about documentaries. I've had two others that I've I've talked with um, Todd Miller the border journalist, he's done a book that y'all would both be very interested in, everybody would, called Empire of Borders, about how we have exported Border Patrol mm -hmm. all over the world. We have mm -hmm. Border Patrol everywhere. There's hardening of borders for people who can cross and who can't cross. Um, um, again, I, I lost my train of thought. Um, where did I start and, and, Well, Russell was talking about other documentaries, and you said there are some oh, other documentaries you've been just, involved with. If you have 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 any idea how much money it takes, um, I was time, able to an, raise. It's incredibly sure. time intensive. Sure. Uh, this particular movie was about fifty thousand dollars. I didn't get paid a penny. Uh, I raised money. Um, I raised about a half of it. My husband and I put in the other half, and my appearances have been such that I've been allowed to pay us back. But all of that is just exhausting, you know. Oh, yeah. and, uh, oh, yeah. and then... It's really tough. It's a tough. And and at the time you made it, because I remember because you were you said you shot this in 2008. That's when I made my first sort of feature length 
film, and that's when I did most of my film work and stuff, like late aughts and stuff. And that was really the last period where it took real money to make a real looking film. Right. It, that was those right. were the last days of the DV tapes. Like yeah. just after that, the technology turned. Where like by 2014, you could get a 4K camera for fifteen hundred dollars and make something that looks pro for not that much. But especially mm -hmm. back then, it was tough. But even um, money for tech. That's not even the the half of it. I mean, to do a doc like this, I could tell all the locations you had to travel to, all the interviews yeah. you had to do, the time just to edit everything. You don't have a screenplay for a no, doc. Yeah. You write it when you edit it. You you sit down to edit it. You got a hundred hours yeah. worth of footage. You got to cut together eighty minutes that make some sort of narrative sense. It's very very hard. I've edited a couple and a good of good cinematographer. Docs myself. I I don't think I could ever become a cinematographer and interview, you yeah. know, and, well, and think. That, yeah. So the cinematographers uh, were costing, even back then, uh, $1,100 a day. Yeah, they're not That's cheap. No. Cinematographers yeah. do not work yeah. cheap. No, and, and they shouldn't. Sure I mean, particularly if you, get a, if you look up and get a good one. Sure, absolutely. Uh, Tusker had a question yeah, I and i lost it where'd it go i i have it you have it okay good <laughs> I, I lost track of it ellen do you know how many migrants get caught up in human trafficking the whole situation is human trafficking the whole right. situation is human trafficking they cannot cross the most would be ill-advised to try to cross the border by themselves although one of the uh, people in the movie talked about, you know, you get out there and the coyote doesn't know what he's doing or she. Right, right. There are other ones that come highly recommended. And even though they sometimes scare the bejesus out of their, the people they're bringing, um, if they get there alive, that's a good coyote. Right, and so they right, have a right. system. This coyote takes you to here and this, mm. coyote, you know, and you get to uh, Cleveland or wherever. Um, but, but that is human trafficking. And as, um, Mary Bauer, the lawyer with Southern Poverty Law Center says, um, the guest worker program is human trafficking. Right. right. You know? It's indentured right. servitude. Yeah. It is absolutely. Right. Indentured Even when servitude. it works out, it's human trafficking. It, right. right. Exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, <sighs> I mean, yeah, I don't know what else to call it other than human trafficking. I suppose what he's asking is, are there people who get involved in trafficking for sexual purposes? Or drugs um, or something like that, too. Yeah. Perhaps. And, of course, um, I mean, without doubt that happens. I mean, <laughs> it, for example, when they, when they, re, when they, deportation has this long, um, system you have to go through with judges and stuff. When they just repatriate you, I I've talked to, to girls who were 16 years old when they were taken across the border, put out in the middle of the night, they've taken all their possessions, they've taken all their money, and there they are. What are they right. supposed to do? Right. Right. You know, if they can find their way to a shelter, you know, that'll feed them for a day or two. But I mean, I think the whole uh, sex trafficking thing has been sort of, it's not that it's not there, but it's that it's not the real issue because you, you get an H2 worker, a guest worker, that guest worker is bound to that one employer. The visa right. doesn't go to right. the worker. The visa goes to the employer. Right. So if the worker, the employer gets a worker here and she or he thinks they're going to be shucking oysters down on the Gulf Coast, but what she's really wanted for is sexual favors, there's nothing she can do about it. She right. can't take that. That visa is not portable. Right. So now they're talking about, well, making the visa portable, but you have to stay, but only for agriculture, and you have to stay in agriculture. Well, as we've seen with these uh farm workers, they are very isolated. 
And I noticed that when I when I listen and sometimes try to talk with um, Mexicans or Spanish speaking people here in Huntsville and other places, I usually can follow it. But the people out in these uh, agricultural industries or citrus, um, they they're so far removed that they their accent doesn't even. Um, change you know what I'm saying they still have a a very regional accent that I I could not track ever interesting if that makes sense and then you've got people like well never mind I'm getting off subject <laughs> I want to okay. talk about what people are actually interested in <laughs> no that's okay I think we're coming down the home stretch here we had a couple of people ask about the music about the songs oh, uh, that you, you choose and did you have people write yeah, songs that was, for you it was very very well chosen um well it's just that 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 song um in no Spanish. Morir. oh wow oh yeah. that's pablo yeah. and he actually i have a soundtrack if anybody's interested i have you can stream it um you can uh, i don't have the dvd i have a few dvds if anybody wants one um and i don't charge them they're five or six dollars something like that um but pablo so I went on a, a migrant trail walk. I walked from Sasa Bay to Tucson with a group. Um, it took seven days. And several times, this troubadour named Pablo came out with the other people who were bringing water to us and stuff. Uh -huh. And he would sing his songs. And I got to talking with him. Well, he's now become my brother by another mother. <laughs> he is mi hermano and I'm his hermana. And, you know, we talk on the phone, all that stuff. But he just lent me everything I wanted. He had already written that song. Uh -huh. And uh, then there were a couple of other songs that he let me include on the soundtrack, if anybody's interested. Pablo is a force. He is a force. He, yeah, it was a great well, song. He's a great that. singer. Yeah, yeah, uh, that and that then, song was really intense. And the other singer singers that you heard, one was a young man I uh, met on this same walk. Walk. His name is Jordan Bullard, and he was coming back from having spent a year at, at a shelter in Oco Prieta. And, um, you know, he was singing these songs and, you know, I just asked, you know, who, who's writing your songs? Well, I am. How about you let me use them in my uh -huh. movie? He, he wrote the song about Birmingham. Uh, he's a Southerner, too. And uh -huh. uh, the song where it ends up on the picture of the death of the Cherokee Birdman on the right, cross. Right, right. That came from in um, when he was working in the shelter, they brought in a woman whose name was um, Geronimo's daughter. And uh, she was indigenous and she didn't want to have her picture taken, you know. Uh, so that's that was the inspiration. So the, the inspiration for these songs comes from people who have been in direct contact with immigrants they're not having to resort to um um not pete seeger uh the uh, uh y'all know, you know who i'm talking about russ a little come to you um woody woody guthrie woody, yeah. woody, guthrie, woody yeah. guthrie's um <laughs> Yeah, about the plane that crashed. And, you know, these are people who have direct contact on the ground. And I think that's one of the reasons why the music is so powerful. And yeah, then I really yeah. wanted something that was more hip hop or urban. And so I just put out word, you know, to submit some music to me if you thought, you know, you had something. And and so Tony Zapata um um, submitted uh, Latinos Presente and I used that and then Microwave Dave who wrote the song about why did you take my job and then also an instrumental um, 
Microwave Dave is somebody you really, you need his music in your life. American Peasant. He is, he's a former um, Alabama Bluesman of the Year. Again, uh -huh. he wrote this these songs for me uh -huh. for free. Others lent me their songs, but he wrote these songs. He would not charge me for it. Um, and, uh, but he, um, he is so good. Stephen King, while writing one of his uh, novels, his playlist was Microwave Dave and the, oh, uh, Microwave Dave's songs. Or microwave. His band is called The Nukes. The Nukes, um, okay. But anyway, that doesn't seem to have penetrated his politics, though. Who's? Stephen King. Oh, Stephen, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Bless his heart. He don't know. That's he very that know. that is that is very southern Christian of you. Bless his heart. Yeah, bless his heart. <laughs> uh Tusker with know. the donation. Thank you, Tusker. Appreciate that. For Ellen's excellent response to my question. We should send it to her, not to us. But no, thank no, no. Y'all so, yeah, keep it. Y'all <laughs> keep it. Well, um, all right. So last call for questions. If anybody has any last minute ones, I think we pretty much got to everything. I so think, and, and I think we, in honor of Ellen's sensibilities, I don't think we cursed once on this stream. Look I at you. So. Y'all yeah. are just coming right along. We, we can turn it on and off. <laughs> yeah. You know to make, make a guest so, feel at home. We just usually keep it on. All right, exactly. <laughs> we can turn it off. I would love to be able to see the chat. Is there any way for me to? Oh, you it? can't I don't see it. Goes yeah, away. I don't I think didn't. the the guests in the studio can see the chat. We have the chat right I, on. I up saw our it when we board. were on the uh, combo couch. Yeah. When you're oh. on the combo couch, you saw the public chat. Yeah, I saw the chat. I thought that I mean, was a I private chat. Switch over and I can see it. Yeah, if you watch it, but, if you have like YouTube open in a separate window, you can see it. Yeah, I, I can see it now. That's what oh, I was okay. like. I was yeah. just wondering if. Uh, Whoa, there was a lot of comments there. There was a lot. Yeah, no, we had a Whoa. very lively chat. That's what I said. If you want to take <laughs> Is there any way you can leave it up for me after y'all? Well, what what happens is on YouTube, it'll go away for like a few hours after the broadcast ends, and then it'll come back. So I think oh, really? in like 12 hours, the chat will be back up. So you'll be oh, able okay. to see it as part of the public video. It goes I away do. for a while while it processes. I don't know what it does. They, they, but send, it, they send it to the NSA. Yeah, right. They, they find exactly. out who was on their the people chat. Comb through it. Exactly. <laughs> and they give it back. Exactly. When we when we interviewed Tara, I was like, that's it. We're we're in a file now. She yeah. uh she did <laughs> that was that was an amazing uh enlightening interview. I did not know all of those things. But yeah, she she's was, great. I she knew about Biden and all of that, but I didn't know that she was that it there was more to it. But y'all are doing good. Thank you. Alrighty. Well, thank, thank you. you so much, Ellen. We really appreciate you letting us screen this and, you know, letting us know that you had this movie. I think it just came up when you called into the show of about a, yeah. a couple months back. And we right. said, oh, yeah, right. well, we I have think to. So. Look, you get, you're getting oh, love there. You, Ryan. I heart you, you love. too. Oh, yeah. You got a lot of love on the chat here. You're, you, you got a lot of comments to read through tomorrow oh, morning. I think, they'll, I think the way it works is 12 hours after the stream ends, the chat comes back. Okay. Uh, so it should be back up by like ten thirty tomorrow. Well, morning. I appreciate um we, we I appreciate we, everybody watching it and I appreciate so much y'all doing this. I really do. Oh, absolutely. And you know, we had a decent audience tonight live, but obviously it's gonna be up on the channel for as long as YouTube will have us. Um and so <laughs> Um, you know, you it'll, 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 it'll get plenty more views in the coming days. And, and yeah, uh, yeah. So awesome. until, ben, until Ben Shapiro offers us $50 million. Right. Until Ben Shapiro <laughs> offers us $50 million. You have to split it with me. In four years. Uh, right, exactly. we, yeah. we are not going to stop cursing. <laughs> Don't worry. Don't worry. Yeah, no. That. No. We, we, we are the only, oh, I, I would wager we are the only left YouTube show with a resident uh, preacher, though. I don't think yes. any, anybody you may else be. Has that. You may be. It's not. Uh, <laughs> usually those streams don't cross. <laughs> you know. All right. Well, thank you so much, Ellen, for joining us. Thank you for this film. It was great. We had a great time with everybody here. Um, we will see you guys all again on Sunday. Busy week this week. We, we did some interviews on Monday. Then we were live Wednesday, Thursday, and this evening. And then... Uh, 
I'm going to watch the Giants and the Eagles tomorrow night, Saturday night. Going to watch some football. Take a good old fashioned American day off and watch some football. Good and for you. Be back on Sunday. Just a little, little, little preview. We'll uh, we'll talk about it more. We'll see what happens. I'm having a meeting with the uh, People's Project there. Oh, the about, People's Forum? About uh, the People's Forum with the space on 37th about doing political theater there. So we may expand. We've talked about this. We may expand it to do dissidents political theater. Do dissidents productions. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It was we should, inevitable. We, you, you could do like a politically themed one act festival. That's what I used to do. Yeah. I used to do that. So, yeah, I would probably bring that back. I called it vignettes for the apocalypse, which you know. I was going to say you're probably <laughs> I was going to describe, unfortunately, because of the state of politics amongst New York theater people, it probably you get a lot of submissions that I could only describe if I at the last second break our streak of not cursing in Ellen's presence, so I won't, because I want to make, I want to complete this as a clean. <laughs> oh, I know, this. I know, but no, when you do a call for submissions, that's national. Exactly, that's right. National. Well, sure, of course, yeah, but for the record, yeah. yeah. Uh, no, yeah. I know, that's part of what's been keeping me out of the scene, because I know these people are going to drive me insane. I, yeah. I'm, I'm just, I, you know, I'm thinking. I saw they a play festival, there was a one-act play, real quick, I know where you are going to wrap soon. This was, you know, mid 2010 something like that when i was living in the city a friend of mine was in a play and it, 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 it was at a one act it wasn't a festival it was like an evening of one acts and my friend was an actor so he was great i mean his show was actually good but this other play this you know, quote-unquote political play it was literally a trans man describing the transition process that is not a play there was literally no story, no conflict, no arc, no nothing. It was literally a trans man and his friend, and the guy just explained to his friend what it took to transition. I mean, this is what passes for, you know, political art. Goodness. Yeah, it's just just it uh, just a virtue boring. signal for its own sake. Just I mean, you absolutely could, blatant. You could Google yeah. that. I <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, man. I well, that's okay. I have hopes for these guys because they're really in a more economic left orientation. Like they're more talking about things like this, like the economic conditions in Latin America. Like sure. I think the problem I might have with them is I am not a true Marxist myself. But you know what? At least we're looking at things from the through the same lens. Like right. I have thus far, they seem rather. It's the old school left. They're not really interested yeah. in talking about divisive things that divide the working class. They're coming more from that right, right. perspective. So that I can that I can live with. We can have some disagreements about what what a revolution looks like. At, at least you're talking in the same general language. So that that is my hope. And at that point, look, yes, the actors have been, especially in New York, have been totally overrun by privileged middle class identity politics laden schmucks. That's it's, not a curse. I mean, that's kind of a curse, but you don't speak Yiddish, so it's okay. Yeah, right. Not really. <laughs> you don't actually you know, know that. what that. You, you don't, don't actually know, know what that, that I means. I don't speak Yiddish. I'll give you a fun fact. You know who spoke Yiddish? Who's James, that? James Cagney. He, he he grew up on the Lower East Side until he was 13. He spoke fluent Yiddish. No kidding. Even so, I don't think schmuck is necessarily fact. a curse. It technically describes the male genitalia. That is yeah, but technically that's technically not really a curse. <laughs> it's not really a curse. I mean, it's crude, but it's not a curse. Don't make me say it in English, because then I will no, definitely. Then I will no, we're definitely going to do what we should. Street. Yeah, we're actually going to actually sign off this time. Um, <laughs> thank you, everybody, very much. Thank you uh, for this film. It was great to talk to you again, and uh, we hope you call in. Maybe, maybe call in Sunday. You talking about me? Yeah, talking about oh, you, Ellen. Absolutely. Uh, oh, call me, call in Sunday. Well, maybe I will. No. Don't encourage me. Well, no, yeah. Don't give me the mic. <laughs> <laughs>
All righty. Well, thanks, everybody, very much. Uh, this will be up after. So if you came in late and you want to watch it from the start, you can go ahead and just hit that rewind. Uh, it'll be watchable uh, as soon as we sign off here. So thank you guys very, very much. Thank you to the Reverend Dr. Ellen Jimerson for joining us, our good friend. Thank you so much and great job. You're welcome. That's a great film. You're welcome. Thank you. All right, everybody. We will see you guys back here on sunday i don't have my outro because this is a separate template here but uh we're don't just going to cut out pretty abruptly thing. here what's that courage courage that's see my dan rather time. tribute oh yeah <laughs> all right everybody like i said i don't have no outro music so it might be an abrupt sign off but thank you very much we'll see you sunday